Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. And since in the beginning, I always have the most of your attention. So I just want to say very quickly about my meetup that is coming in London next week. Um, I will be emailing you through my mailing list. So also on Instagram and uh, where else? On the locals as well. Those of you who have purchased any of my books or books for children, please bring them over. If you have a chance, I will be more than happy to sign them for you. And one more thing before um, we jump into conversation here, I would like you to type in, in the comments suggestions for the place. I have a place that I really love in London, but maybe you come up with something and it will be good if the group is a little bigger. So with all of this being said, Today, I am joined again by truly one of the best geopolitical analysts out there, um, Alex Christopher. Welcome back, Alex. Hello, Anya. Thank you for having me back. Great to be here. Thank you so much. And um, my audience absolutely loves you and appreciates you. So do I. Very grateful for your time and being frequent guest. So today I was thinking what we will start with. <laughs> what do you think? Okay, so I start with a quote for a change. And the quote is, and I'm 100% I'm sure you will recognize who said it. Here is the quote. All the world's a stage and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances. And one man in his time plays many parts. Yes. <laughs> well... Everyone knows who said that quote, but I'm going to give you a different uh, person that said that quote, or actually repeated that quote. And I wonder if there's going to be any people from Canada watching. But uh, the rock group Rush actually had a song called Limelight, and they actually referenced that exact quote in that song. And I say Canada because they're a Canadian group, and Neil Peart, uh, rest his soul, one of the greatest if not the greatest drummer in history. So we all know who said the original quote, but I'm giving you an alternative to that quote. Thank you, Alex. So now everyone is getting to know more of the personal Alex, you see? That's how I talk to people, everyone. <laughs> okay, um, now on the serious notes, of course, William Shakespeare, and actually I didn't remember from what play, but this was from As You Like It, okay? Now, this will be a serious question because I have been going through this in my mind, especially very recently in the last few days, a lot. Here it is the question. Is Putin a player that is playing his part and we are all being played? <laughs> a, lot, a lot of people are saying that. No, I don't think so. I mean, can I say anything with 100% certainty? Of course not. None of us really know, but... No, I don't think so. I think that, uh, oh, it's such a tough one because, you know, if you, if you say something complimentary about Putin, you're a Putin shill. If you criticize Putin, then you're, you're evil. Yeah. <laughs> There's no, there, there really is no middle ground when it comes to I'm Putin. Sorry like yeah, I'm like sorry Trump, I pushed on this spot. It's kind of like Trump. If you say something good about <laughs> Trump, you're, 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 you're terrible. If you say something uh, bad about Trump, you're, you're terrible. Look, um, Putin is a, uh, is, in my opinion, the uh, the greatest leader that, that I have seen in my lifetime of any country. Um, if, and, and I think actually that's justified by the numbers. Like if you look at like all the leaders who have come and gone across so many different uh, countries, um, you look at what Putin has done in his 20 plus years as president and uh, the numbers don't lie. And specifically just numbers on the economy and then the economic growth of, of Russia, the quality of living, everything uh, like that, as well as brand Russia, the prominence of Russia on the world stage. But um, right now what's happening is that, uh, in my opinion, Putin is someone who, and it's, it's not just Putin, it's the entire security council, but he is the president and, um, He's someone that uh, that follows the. I'm trying to think of the word. I want to say law, but maybe that's even too narrow. But let's just go with that. He he's someone that is that that is following the 
the, the legal, the international legal framework, as well as the legal framework in, uh, in Russia. And he decided on a special military operation. He did not want to uh, expand this, uh, this conflict for various reasons. That's how he started it. That's, how, that's where we still are after six months. And he's someone that doesn't deviate very much from, uh, from the plan. He's, he's always been like, like this. Um, he, he's someone that's, that's very much uh, involved in the process. He, he's someone that very much wants to, wants to follow the process, follow the rules. He doesn't like to deviate from plans. He doesn't like to make adjustments. And uh, it served him very, very well throughout his career. But uh, in this scenario, he's betting everything. He is betting everything in this scenario. And uh, he's going up against 30 plus countries that have explicitly said that they want to destroy Russia. I mean, they haven't, they haven't sugarcoated anything. They have said they want to destroy Russia. They want to destroy Putin. They want to get into Russia. They want to take the resources and they want to break Russia up into five or six different countries. They've said it, where they want to de-imperialize Russia. They want to destroy the Russian Federation, period. We're not talking about lower level people. We're not talking about military people. We're talking about the very, very high up of the collective West. They have not hidden their intentions. The, the question is, does, uh, does the Kremlin understand that? I, I would say, of course they understand that, but do they really understand that? that I think that, that th there's a difference there. Yes, they've heard the rhetoric. They've listened to what all these leaders said. They've seen the sanctions. They've seen the, uh, the fighting in Ukraine. They've seen the support that uh, the Ukraine military has gotten. They may have even seen foreign fighters, even NATO fighters in Ukraine at the moment, maybe. I'm not, no one knows for sure, but okay, uh, they could be there. But um, do they really understand that these people want to destroy Russia? I think that's a question that everyone has. You, you know, the evidence is there, but it, everyone's kind of struggling with, with, with the fact of, of, of do, do they get the, 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 existential, the, existential, the existential threat that exists. I, I think, I, I think the, the Kremlin does. I'm, I'm pretty sure they, it does, but uh, you're dealing with a, with the leader in a security council that, that wants to follow the plan. They want to follow the plan. And, and, and it seems like they're not capable of adjustment. Those are my thoughts. And, and it's always worked out well for Putin. In Syria, it worked out well. In, in, in other conflict uh, areas, it worked out well. You know, Syria still hasn't fully been resolved, but it looks like they're getting there. But, but the question is, is Syria is one thing. Georgia is another. Um, Ukraine is, is a whole different deal. Uh, they're betting everything. They're betting everything on this. So. I feel like I will be all over the place again because I had direction and now I just want to go with the flow of this conversation. I agree with you. And I've been thinking like this literally until the last few days. And then something else started to get into my mind about, and I know that this is just, you know, call it conspiracy, however people want to call it. But I was stepping away from all of this and looking at it and thinking, all right, so what's really happening right now? Europe is getting completely destroyed. The economy is sinking, okay? And it's barely, I mean, it's, 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 it's not the beginning, but it's not even <laughs> in the middle of the sinking. We don't even have winter yet. We don't even have fall yet. And then I said to myself, all right, so we have Russia and we have US. US, I mean, honestly, Wall Street, the same people who created World War I, 
World War II, who put, I cannot say the last name, but let's say Adolf into power. Those are, I mean, probably not the same people no longer alive, but you know what I mean? That group, small group really, behind the scenes pulling the strings. And it looks like, I was like, can this be? Can this be that we have, and I don't want to idolize the country I've never been to. Actually, I grew up under communism, but I want to be objective. I really want to be objective and make the sense out of all of it. Who is doing who to who really, Alex? I'm sorry for this long, like it's more, it's not a question. I'm trying to understand this because Rick's great idea, but at the same time, I talked to I.R. Gray and he's saying that Russia is also planning to implement digital currency. Yeah, China has it. India will have it for sure. Um, I don't know. What, what is this really? Well, I mean, I, I, I don't think we should get lost in the weeds with digital currency and, and stuff. I mean, we're all going to get digital currency. Just everyone needs to accept it. It doesn't matter what country you're going to live in. Things are going to get digital. We, in a way, we already have digital currency. I, I mean, in the United States, if if uh, if you get canceled, the banks for some reason, if you if you speak out against certain certain groups or whatever, and you get canceled by the uh, by the big tech cartel, you know, most likely your bank's going to cancel you or your Visa or Mastercard. We've seen it happen already. So, you know, the fact that 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 you can get canceled from from using payments it already exists. So so I, I worry about digital currency as well, but it's already here and, and we're already going to get it. It's just going to be more digital than what it is right now. Um, you know, in your bank account, you don't actually have real fiat paper money. Mm -hmm. I mean, everything's digital. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, the question is, is which countries are going to uh, to allow you to, to, to live freely. You know, having a digital currency is one thing, canceling people because they have different opinions and not allowing them to use that digital currency is a completely different thing. And uh, I haven't seen evidence of that in, in Russia, me personally, I, I personally haven't, I haven't read anything about, about Russian cancel culture. I don't even know if it exists to be quite honest, woke cancel culture. In the West, I know it's, I know it exists. I, I live with it every day. So uh, I think that kind of answers your question there. Does it mean that yeah. Russia can't get woke and can't have cancel culture? No, they, they could, but I don't see it happening. But, but see, then we start getting into a whole different conversation of, uh, yeah. of spirituality, religion. Yes. Um, but maybe that's a part all, of the all of, plan. Well, maybe that's, yeah, I mean, absolutely. The West is about removing history, religion, culture, and these things because it probably facilitates their ability to control the population, while other countries seem to to be embracing it. But but I I think we we start getting into a whole different uh, conversation. I I just want to say that as far as digit the concern about digital currency, I understand digital currency very very well. I understand crypto very well, um, but we already have a kind of digital currency and people are already getting canceled. So if Russia implements digital currency and if the US impl implements digital currency, they're gonna do it. But the question becomes, do, do, they, do they abuse this, uh, this type of payment system? And if they abuse this type of payment system, what other options do you have? You have Bitcoin, you have other, uh, other options. And do they try to take that away from you, the country that you live in? Do they try to close all those roads as well? I mean, it's really easy to find, to find a place where, where, where this can coexist, digital currency and, and your freedom. Go to a place that has digital, it's gonna have digital currency, say Russia's gonna have digital currency, fine. But take a look, what, is, what are their policies with regards to, to crypto payments and, and stuff like that? And I think there you'll understand. Where, where this country's heading. I, I say that for every, I'm just using Russia as an example. I say that for, for everywhere. I mean, 
it's here. Digital currency is here. As far as you know, World War III and and what they're trying to do, I think they've already done it. We're already we're already there. You know, we're already there. And uh, but I feel, maybe. Alex, like this is Wall Street destroying Europe. When I look at Poland, I can see it clearly. <laughs> well, Europe's already done. It's all, it's over. It's over. It's not uh, whether it's Wall Street or whether it's uh, I would say Europe did it to themselves. I wouldn't even put the blame on Wall Street. If you want my opinion, I wouldn't blame Wall Street. Wall Street's going to do what Wall Street does. They're going to look to make money at, at all yeah. costs. They don't care. Yeah. That's what they're going to look to do. If it means they have to go to war, they're going to go to war. If it means they have to put a country under austerity, they're going to put a country under It doesn't matter. But Europe volunteered for it. They <laughs> willingly volunteered for it. I mean, there's no other way to describe it. They're, they, they're doing everything to themselves. This has nothing to do with Putin or Russia or Ukraine or the, the, the illness that we had a couple of years ago. They're doing it all to themselves. And even the lockdowns that we had, that was a human choice. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Thank yeah. you for this. Yes, that exactly. That was a human choice to lock down. Yes. No one, no one yes. said... Don't yeah. lock down. No one. It, they said, no, we're going to make a choice to lock down. They, there was a hundred other options. Everyone presented it as if there were no mm -hmm. other options. Mm -hmm. There was exercise. There was sunlight. There was vitamin. I mean, I'm not going to get into it uh, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. for, mm -hmm. for various reasons, but um, everything's a choice. And the sanctions are a choice. There's no treaty with Ukraine. There's, there's no NATO. Ukraine is not a NATO. Ukraine is not in the European Union. Now it's a candidate country, but before it became a candidate country, which they just kind of shoved through. The, they just kind of approved the process, even though Ukraine doesn't fulfill any of the requirements to enter the European Union, zero. But Ukraine is still not an EU member. There is zero that binds Poland to Ukraine, zero, zero. There is, you can there say, is something, but there is something, Alex. I what? tell you what it is. Certain politicians who have a background that comes from Ukrainian roots, who are paid by the Wall Street to run the certain mm -hmm. program and certain agenda and certain programming on the media so people follow their direction. This is what I'm saying. I'm not, that's, I mean, I'm sorry. Yeah. No, no, to me, that's different. You know, to say that, that, that Lviv is a Polish city historically, yes, no one's going to deny that. But I'm saying as far as legal treaties. Yeah are okay. concerned poland is not obligated in any way shape or form to protect ukraine treaty wise now if there's an emotional connection if the people of poland tell their leaders the people of ukraine are actually polish so we have to protect them i mean that's not the case but okay if, if the polish people say that and they say we have to protect the people of ukraine because they're actually polish mm -hmm. I'm just saying, I'm throwing hypotheticals out there. And okay, these are all different, but different stories, but there is no legal treaty obligation. There's no agreement. There's, there's nothing that binds an, a European country, the United States or Canada to, to go the route that it did, to impose sanctions, to, to do all of these things. This was a choice by the leadership, plain and simple. They decided we want to destroy but Russia. Okay, How but their decision, sorry to interrupt you so much today, because I really am like, so this decision is, is based on someone telling them what to do. Sure, maybe. I mean, we all think yes, but, you know, you, we were, we're kind of, once again, getting into the, the debate, which all of us think about, all of us, I think about it all the time as well. <laughs> is, there, is there a Klaus Schwab-like figure on top that's dictating this? Are there a bunch of Klaus Schwab figures on top dictating this? Or are these people really that incompetent and really that dumb or really that destructive? And well, I, I think no they, can choose, that. they choose, but they choose incompetent and destructive. Like you said about Zelensky last time, you yeah. said they have the profile, remember? You said yeah, they have they, the, his profile, so they have the profiles. Yes, they, they, they do. But, you know, someone, someone can come and argue all 30 of the Western countries are like that. And you could say yes.
But maybe someone will say that statistically that can't be. But then you can say, well, trust me, there's a force that's put all these people in place. I, I don't have the answer. I personally believe it's a mix of both. Okay. That's what I personally, I, actually, I think it's a mix of three things. I think you have people who are incompetent. I think you have people that are doing this for, for very cynical reasons or for reasons of power and money. And I think you have a layer of, of, of oligarch control, WEF control that is also pulling the strings. I think maybe it's a combination of all three things, but that's all I'm saying is that's just my, my mm -hmm. thinking about it. It's, I'm not saying that's what's really going on. I'm, I'm not in this group. <laughs> I've never been to Davos. Thank I've never God. sat at the table. Thank God. So I don't know what they talk about. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. It could be just pure incompetence. These people could be purely incompetent and purely crazy and, and sociopathic and okay. That's a very distinct possibility. It's hard for me to believe. Um, I feel like you just said that there are three, three factors there. Yeah, I, I actually- yeah, Maybe there's I, four, I, maybe there's two. I don't, you know. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but I throw myself into this conversation now completely lost the track of my questions but it's all connected i mean really it's all connected um so let's stay into europe for a moment and let's talk about i would like to hear from you what you think about this the next steps as far as economy financial situation and i see it i don't know if that's the way it will be um i mean level level down to ground zero pretty much push it and then we have the guaranteed income and after that guaranteed income maybe at the same time at the end of it we have this digital currency and then they will try to do some score credit score system or things like this um Poland, as you probably know already, you know those things, has been tested, is actually going through this testing, is the third country in Europe that is going through this uh, guaranteed income testing. I would like to hear from you how you see this economically, Alex, the next steps that they will take. Look, I, the, the guaranteed income is, is something that they, that they want as well, but you, know, you always have to think about guaranteed income, but with what money? I, all, all these countries are broke. They can't go on printing money in infinite. They're broke. They don't even have, they're not even going to have heat for their people. So I, I, I understand the plan that, that a lot of us believe is, is coming to, uh, to fruition, but I, I think that this is, they've hit a roadblock and, and that roadblock is reality. I, I think these are nice thoughts. For example, I think the Green Party in Germany, I think Annalena Baerbach and Robert Habeck have these interesting, wonderful thoughts about a green utopia where everything is nice and pretty and green and everything is running off of windmills and, and solar and, and there's, there's puppy dogs and, and beautiful white rabbits everywhere. And everything is, is great. No one's working, but yet everyone is, is, uh, is super happy. And, and the state is this big mother or father that's just hugging everybody. <laughs> okay. This, these, is these the, are... this is the ministry, the ministry of love, like in 1984. Well, th this is yeah. kind of the, the, the thinking of, uh, of this, this ideology, this cult. And it is a cult. I believe, mm -hmm. pe people always always get on me. Like, oh, Alex, you don't you don't like uh, you're a green denier. I'm, I'm, it's not that I'm a denier. I think this thing has spiraled out of control and has become an ideology and a cult. I really do. I believe that that we should keep our neighborhoods clean. We should not litter. We should try our best to uh, to look after our our environment. But let's not turn it into into a religion. Let's not turn it into. Uh, mm -hmm a death cult which is what it's become so i think it's a death think they, cult, yeah yeah i think they have these dreams but you know these are children but they're stuck in a child mindset but they've been given a lot of power you know these are kids with with dynamite is, is what they are these are children and you've given them you know these mm -hmm. these these weapons or this dynamite and you're saying okay here you go 
And so these kids are like saying, great, I got this done. And I'm going to blow everything up. Oh my goodness. <laughs> you know, and, and they are. But, you know, th these could be the plans. And these could be these grand master plans that they have in their head. But, you know, th there's also a reality. There's, there's physics and there's science and there's economics and... Okay, there's, Alex, all, but, there's all kinds of realities that they can't trust spend. is printing more money now, right? For you, great, great print <laughs> reality is going to hit her sooner or later, though. I mean, she can print all she wants, that's fine. She can print all she wants sooner or later, though. It's reality is going to catch up to her money printing probably so much the, sooner than she expects. So, when you say the reality hits what's the picture i think we all know the picture of europe <laughs> the european union we all know it we all understand it the, the question is is what are the people going to do how are the people going to react i believe that they've test piloted already how people react with some sort of adversity that's thrown their way some sort of scare mm -hmm. they've already test piloted it They've done their, their, their fear, their fear mongering. They've uh, implemented their restrictions. And uh, for the most part, people went along with it. So I believe that they're probably thinking as we hollow out our societies in order to get to this, this great reset paradise, what we did a year ago or two years ago, we can just implement it again but we'll just repackage it. You know, Habeck, like Habeck said, we're not going to mm -hmm. call it a lockdown. What we'll do is we'll say small or medium-sized businesses, take a pause. You don't really need to sell. You don't really need to sell cups of coffee. It's okay. Don't worry about it. Take, take a six month break. Yeah, come with thermos, break. come with thermos to the coffee shop. Yeah, 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 exactly. You don't, you know, who you don't really need customers. Take a, take a one or two year break and come back in two years. That was his message. So, you know, they're just repackaging mm -hmm. things that they've already done. They're remarketing, rebranding. Yeah. Will people go along with it? That's the question. I Will actually, no, I, I don't think, I think this will be a little bit different response that was um, in 2020. And what I think they actually want, and I speak for Poland, because now I'm watching this much more closely than before, they want people to go on the streets because they want to grab them. And, and this is actually not a good idea for everyone to do, to protest like that. It's not, because it will not only harm them. You know, can I tell you, this is very personal now, but I found something. I was cleaning this apartment here where I am. And I found things, my parents moved in here, well, my father, 1947, something like this. He will be 90 years old this, this month, actually, my father. And I was going through stuff, literally vintage, <laughs> ancient stuff. And I found this letter. I think they sent it to the, the company, the, the, the place, the factory who was engineered there, he worked there from 1970 and it was typed like on the typed machine and it said from some official place i don't know i have to look again please don't go out on the streets it was about the protests don't go out on the streets and please keep children at home and students at home because this might be very dangerous i was like what am i reading here so they were sending letters it looks like you know my father didn't tell me this to households not to go out and protest. Sorry for this, everyone, because I know this is interview, but I think it's important to share this because we've been there before, how many times, right? Yes, yeah. Yeah. history repeats itself, you know, and that's what everyone's, it rhymes. History doesn't repeat or it rhymes, or it rhymes, it doesn't repeat. We've all heard the phrases with this before. Yeah, we've, we've been here before. There's, there's, no, there's no real difference between the European Union and the USSR. It really isn't. Yeah, okay, the EU is a little more free than the USSR, but it's basically the same thing, basically. You know, it's, it, it's a state on top of a state. It's a bunch of unelected officials 
who control our lives, our presidents and prime ministers are not really presidents and prime ministers. They're kind of like governors, mayors or governors. They're not really presidents of countries. They're not really sovereign with the exception of Orban. And look at what they're doing to Orban. They're, they're, they're trying to destroy him. It's a never ending story, but it's a Politburo of five or six people of which I'm positive if you went to the street and interviewed people at random, no one would know who, who Ursula van der Crazy is or Michelle or any of these people or Burrell, no one would know, but these are the people that are running your lives. Mm -hmm. They're unelected, they're completely incompetent. Their past history is a history littered with failure, littered with failure, one failure after another after another, from Lagarde to van der Leyen, these are yes. career failures, but they've been placed in this position and, and they control our, our gas, our oil, our money supply, our press freedom, everything, everything, our travel. You know, pe you, you know Europe, Europeans need to really wake up because when this conflict started, and uh, the European Union decided to place their shock and awe sanctions at Russia. What was the first two things that they did? The first two things, which shows mm -hmm. the, the type of authoritarian rule we have. They shut down the media from Russia, so they cut away our press freedom, and they, cut the, and they shut down the airspace to travel from Russia. Mm -hmm. And they did that as European Union territory not Greek territory, not Polish territory. They made the decision on behalf of all of Europe. They told the European Union countries, they told Poland, they told the people of Poland, unelected EU Brussels bureaucrats, they said, you can't visit the RT website. Mm -hmm. They told the people of Poland, you are not allowed to get on a plane and travel to Russia or Belarus. You're not allowed. Not the Polish government, Ursula van der Leyen. Did you vote for Ursula van der Leyen? No. Was she a candidate to, for some sort of office in your country? No. But she's making decisions uh, which, which, which affect your sovereignty as a, as a free thinking uh, human being. Mm -hmm. Now it's one thing if the Polish authorities said as Poland, we're gonna cut all Aeroflot flights as Poland, as a government, at least there you can say, well, wait a minute, either I agree, I agree with law and justice, or you can say, you know what, really? Well, next election, I'm voting you out because of the stupid stuff that you're doing. Or you could get out onto the street and protest. You also have that right, at least you know who you're protesting against. You're protesting mm -hmm. against, uh, uh, the prime minister, Morovetsi, and then all of these people, at least you have a face, a name. People in Poland, get out onto the streets. Who are you protesting against? Some, some technocrats, bureaucrats in Brussels? Hey, good luck. Good luck. Go, into, go onto the streets in Warsaw and protest to your heart's content. It doesn't affect uh, van der Leyen. Traffic isn't going to stop for her. She doesn't have any inconveniences. This is why I'm saying exactly. we, we've been here exactly. before. Yes. <laughs> we, we've yes. already lived under the USSR. We've seen it. Some people have seen it. Some people may not remember it, but we've been here before. It's just been repackaged, rebranded. It's a lighter version. Think of it like USSR light, like, you know, Coke light, <laughs> Diet Coke. This is USSR light. Which is worse. It may be even, it may be even more sinister. Well, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Because it's light, mm -hmm. it's even mm -hmm. more sinister. The process of removing the sugar, like the, the, the fat-free, the same, it's actually yeah. worse. It's actually worse. Yeah. At least with the USSR, you knew who the Politburo was. I mean, they lived in your country. They lived in Moscow. You, you knew who they were. You knew their faces. You knew their names. At, at least they were there. At least they were of the same culture, of the same country, of the same language. You know, that at least they were accessible. In this case, these people aren't even accessible. Mm -mm. I'm, in, I'm in Cyprus right now. These people are in Brussels. There's, there's zero that connects us, zero, zero. There's zero religion, zero culture, zero language, zero 
History, zero. Nothing connects Cypriots mm -hmm. and Greeks to the rulers in Brussels. Nothing, nothing. And the whole, that's why they go on with EU values all the time, EU, because they're making stuff up. They need to find some connecting tissue. They can't sit there. If you're in Poland and you're, and you're, and you're Polish, you see someone who's Polish and right away, there's a connection. When you travel and you're in a different country, here's someone speaking Polish, you say, oh, there, there's something now, there. Now I don't feel like I'm in Poland so much lately, oh, Alex, by the way. That's of, of course. Just saying. The, the, the point on all, on all of this is that, that there's, there's nothing that, that connects these leaders to, yes. to where we are, where I am. They don't know my problems, mm -hmm. our problems, my, my city's problems, my country's problems. Mm -hmm. Nor do they care, nor should they care. <laughs> Why should they care about what Greeks go through? They're not Greek. <laughs> you know, I mean, I mean, I mean it's comparing, European, comparing European Union to the Greek culture tradition. And I mean, I mean I'm not even going to go there now because it's. it's no, but but yeah. being Greek does, does have a certain set of, of values, of characteristics. Yeah, yeah. Traditions, uh, traditions, and, and even you know, like like emotions. I mean, Greeks, mm -hmm. it's, they're stereotypes. Yes, they are stereotypes. I'm not. I'm not saying that this isn't. You're not stereotyping a, a, a people. But you know, the, the the language, the way they speak. Maybe Greeks are more. They use their hands more. Maybe I mean, little things. But but my point in all of this is that there is a certain set of values inherent in what it means to be a Greek uh, mm -hmm. person. There is no such thing as EU values <laughs> European. That doesn't exist. <laughs> it doesn't exist. We're, we're all very distinct countries. Each country is mm -hmm. beautiful. Mm -hmm. Each country is fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yes, we're all humans. We're all different, but we're, we're the same. I, I get all of that stuff, but you travel to a different country because you want to absorb the culture. You want to, you know, listen to the language. You want to go to the theaters or see their art or learn something new. You want to expose yourself to some new things, uh, you know, enrich your soul. Try yeah, different, different foods. Different foods, exactly. Mm -hmm. There's no such thing as an EU cuisine. Is there an EU cuisine? I don't think so. There that isn't. Is there, is there an EU language? This will no. be the title for this video. It's true. Do, do you speak, when you travel, do you, do you listen to someone who speaks EU or someone who speaks European? Esperanto. Esperanto. Yeah. They Espera want hey, to you speak <laughs> European. <laughs> oh, cool. <laughs> do you joke. walk in the street in a different country what and say, hey, joke. you know, she looks European? No. <laughs> oh, actually, <laughs> I've heard this. I've heard this in the United States a lot. I am very, you know. I'm very European, but I so anyway. agree. Everything you said, it's just brilliant. No, it's brilliant what you said. That's why they tell us all the. That's why they drive it. People need to mm -hmm. think. Why does the European Union uh, make it mandatory for every member country, wherever they have their flag, you have to have the EU flag next to it. You have to. Oh my goodness! Everywhere here, Alex, can I tell you? everywhere you have to though you have to it's part of the requirements they do that because they understand all these people understand that there's there is no eu identity they're trying to build something they're trying to build an illusion we're going to go off it we're, we're not going to get we're not going to let russia destroy eu values what are you talking about russia is a thousand year old civilization the European Union is, is not even a baby. The European Union is, 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 is the little sperm. It's not, even a, it's not even a human yet. Never will be, by the way. And it, yeah, exactly. That's, that, that, that's, that's the point that I'm trying to make. Is <laughs> That's why they create this illusion of, of European Union and the flag has to be everywhere. And, yeah. and we have to you know, create all these different events and, and, and make people have different... Um, celebrate different days and and do all these things because we have to build an identity where there is no identity and there never will be an identity can i say that greece is part of the european continent yeah sure great cyprus eh, it's kind of a little bit in europe mm -hmm. it's a little bit in the middle east it's a little bit off africa mm -hmm. it's true yeah and there are differences in cyprus 
than, than Greece. I mean, we have differences. It doesn't mean that, that we're not the same type of, of people as far as language and Greek heritage, but there's differences in the cuisine and there's differences in our accents. Even in Poland, I'm sure when you travel to different areas, you find yes. differences. Yes. You know, someone from Milan is very different from someone in Rome, but they're still Italians. Yeah, the real Italy is Sicily, apparently. So hello to Sicilians here. <laughs> <laughs> so, but it's know, true. It's true. It's true. It's there is no identity. There is no. It's nothing. It's empty. It's empty. It's empty. So they're trying to force it down our throats. The UK had a golden chance to be out of this and Boris Johnson blew it. Yeah, or Boris Johnson. The UK, they, they had their sovereignty. They won back their sovereignty and they completely blew it. Since we're talking about Liz Trust, they completely blew it. You might as well just go back into the European Union. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Whatever chance that you had, you squandered it. Yeah, and I will be there next week. And I love my Italian, uh, Italian, uh, British, English subscribers. Really great people there. Fantastic country. I love country. Beautiful love the country. people. Yeah. And they, and they, ha they were so close, so mm -hmm. close mm -hmm. to charting their own course. And what did they do? They fell back into the globalist. But then I think like maybe it's EU mindset. It's Maybe they all, do it. they all do it to confuse us, Alex. It's just bad leadership, if you want my opinion. It, it was Boris Johnson pretending to be someone who cares about sovereignty. But at the end of the day, he only used Brexit as, as a way to get him into power. He didn't yes. really care about the sovereignty of the, uh, the British people. He just used it as, as a vehicle to get him to where he needed to go. And then when he got to where he needed to go, he took the vehicle, he ditched it, and he got into a new vehicle, got into a new car. Ditched the old car, he got into a new car, said, thank you very much, you got me to, from like, point A to point B. And, yeah, uh, like with his relationships too. <laughs> yeah, if you look at his, yeah. it's actually an yeah. excellent point. You look at his, his mm -hmm. personal history, mm -hmm. and you understand mm -hmm. that this is a guy that's... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So why, why, why he should act different in the no, public no service? Yeah, exactly. No reason why. So can we, because I know that everyone would like to talk about this now, is about the withdrawal. That confused me. This Russian withdrawal really made me think about all of this. That's what, that's what happened to me. When they withdraw from that region, and then I said to myself, all right, they are saving civilians. That's why this is taking so long, because mm -hmm. they don't want to do this NATO style, right? Right. Well, OK, yes, OK, on. OK. But now mm -hmm. what about those civilians who now have to face the coming back situation? <laughs> that is tragic. Mm -hmm. Your opinion, if there will be more withdrawal, will they withdraw from more territories? Or how this will look, I think, I, I, I your think, sense? Look, my sense is, I'll, I'll say it like this. Um, Alexander, the Duran, the work that we do, and Alexander specifically in this instance, look at the video that he put up. Uh, yes. yesterday, September, uh, uh, what's the date? September 11th, I would say, look at the video that he put up September 11th. He explains exactly what happened in Kharkov and Izium. And I'll tell you what was the clue to put the pieces together as to what happened. The New York Times article that ran, which said, the United States is working very, very closely with Ukraine to give them um, surveillance and intel. Now we all knew this. But when the New York Times, a couple of days ago, when they printed this, it, was, it wasn't so much a revelation as it was gloating, bragging. What do I mean by that? The New York Times comes along and they say, what happened in Kharkov? They didn't specifically say this, but this is the, the general vibe of, of their reporting. Everything that happened in Kharkov was because American intelligence and most likely 
I'm not saying it's that's the case, but most likely foreign troops as well, foreign help as well. This is what allowed Zelensky, the Ukraine military, to do what they did in Kharkov. Now, why was the intelligence that the U.S. Uh, was feeding to Ukraine so critical in this instance? Because in this case, after the Ukraine military failed spectacularly in Kherson, they failed. After this failure, the collective West said, you know what, we need a win and we need it bad. Mm -hmm. And we're getting hints, we're seeing that in Kharkov at the moment, or we've been seeing for the past couple of weeks, that the Russian military is starting to withdraw from these areas slowly, slowly. Why are they withdrawing slowly, slowly from Kharkov? Because unfortunately, going back to Putin, the Russian military appears, and, and, and these are, this is speculation, but I think this is very well-grounded speculation. The military in Russia is having to fight a war against NATO with both hands tied behind its back. And they just simply don't have enough manpower to, to hold this line. This huge, huge territory, it's just not enough. And so somewhere along the way, in July or August, someone in the Kremlin finally convinced the leadership to say, you know what? Back in March, we thought that Izium, by capturing Kharkov and Izium, was going to be the way we would liberate Donetsk from north to south. It didn't work out like that for various reasons. Most, most of the reasons are terrain. It was a little difficult to do it. So they changed their plan. Fine, no problem. And they said, we're going to liberate Donetsk from a different route. But the troops were still there. And to be honest, the, the troops that were in this area were kind of, they were just holding the line. They weren't really advancing forward or really, or really doing anything to, to fulfill the requirements of the special military operation of the conflict. They were just kind of there holding things together. And somewhere, somewhere along the way in, in July or August, a decision was made to say, you know what, let's slowly, slowly withdraw the, those forces from this area and slowly, slowly, let's start to reposition them. And slowly, slowly, let's start to, uh, to disengage as best we can from Harkov. And, and there's nothing wrong with that because the Russians have been very clear. This, this is a war that's not built on taking territory. This is not about just grabbing up territory. This is about destroying the Ukraine military. It's about de denazification. They say it. And the territory comes after. Territory comes after. But first, we want to we want to we want to destroy the army, our enemy. So for them, trading territory back and forth is not that big a, of a deal. But there were consequences. For example, the civilians that get left behind. What do you do with that? The PR, the optics of it. So I think that the Russians, over time, they were doing this slowly, slowly, and kind of easing people into it, including the local population. But the US saw what they were doing. They fed the information to, to uh, Ukraine, and Ukraine went in there quickly. Rightly so. They saw the weakness, and they went in. And there, and there really wasn't much fighting when they went in because there really wasn't much Russian resistance because the US intel knew that there wasn't much Russian presence. And so the Russians, they were hoping that they were gonna withdraw slowly, slowly, and then maybe evacuate the people slowly, slowly. Okay, maybe they got 50% of the way through, but then all of a sudden they say, okay, well, look at what they did. They exploited our weakness, they found out. So now we have to speed things up. They managed to get their troops out in an orderly way. I do believe they managed to evacuate quite a lot of people, but some people for various reasons decided to stay or were left behind. This is just unfortunate, yes. And the, uh, the collective West, they spun it, spun it in a way that made it look like the Ukraine military blitzkrieged into, head, into uh, Kharkov, the Russians panicked and they left in defeat and it was a huge victory. Mm -hmm. The Russians didn't leave in panic or defeat. And all the, the media about all these weapons being left behind, it's all fake. All those videos, I've seen them. So many of them are fake. 
of all these weapons and all these tanks. It's BS. The Russians actually were planning and did execute a very orderly retreat. They just had to speed it up a little. And they got caught a little off guard in their timelines. Was this a debacle though? Absolutely. Because the, the optics of it, the, 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 the PR, the, the way this is framed looked very, very bad for Russia because the Americans did it and the Ukrainians, NATO, they did it when Putin and his team were in the Far East and they were watching 50,000 Russian troops participate in war games while Russia, because of a lack of troops, was trying to reposition stuff. So the optics look terrible. The statement from the Ministry of Defense was terrible. It was a, it, it, we're looking at a communications debacle, a strategic debacle. Eh. I personally, I don't, I don't think it's that big of, of a strategic debacle, but it, it's a mess up and, and, the, and, and rightly so many Russians, a lot of the media, many political analysts, rightly so are saying enough of this, uh -huh. enough mm -hmm. of fighting this war with both of our hands tied behind our back, enough. We can't, we can't continue to do this and we look bad and we're letting Elensky do these victory laps and they're now threatening us and they're saying all these crazy things because they're good at media spin. They're the best when it comes, the, the West is the best when it comes to media. Yes. The best. And so they framed it perfectly. Ukraine went in there quickly, but a lot of the damage was done to Ukraine when they entered. There, there wasn't much, there weren't many casualties on either side, especially the Russian side suffered very little casualties. This was very well planned, the retreat, the withdrawal, but it was already in the works. This wasn't, we got to got to withdraw right away. No, this was planned. They, they were already doing it. But, but the Ukraine military, when they got into Kharkov, yes, then the Russians really hit them and they lost mm -hmm. about 2,000 people. But the media spin, the damage had already been done. And, and, and now, you know, the, you know, Putin and, and his administration, they really need to get a grip on things because he can't turn Ukraine into Syria. He can't turn Ukraine into Transnistria. This can't be another frozen conflict. Russia should not be fighting a defensive war. They shouldn't be on the defense. And so, especially when everyone knows that Russia has the capabilities to, to do whatever it wants, if it wants to do it, but it can't do it as long as they, they put these own, their, these restrictions on themselves. So this is what a lot of people are, this is not Alex speaking, this is what a lot of people are saying in Russia. You may agree with it, you may not. It's, I'm, I'm not sitting here saying, agree with this or don't agree with, agree with a special military, military operation, don't agree with a special military operation. Everyone has their own opinion, but at the end of the day, this is the decision of the Russian people and of the Russian government. I'm, I'm just, I'm just saying what, I'm expressing a lot of the outrage and a lot of the analysis uh -huh. that the Putin administration is now getting, and rightly so, and rightly so. And, and they're going to have to, they're either going to have to do something, make a change or, or, or do something, or they're going to stay the course and they're going to dig in and decide to, to what I believe will be to just kind of freeze the situation, to try and freeze it. Okay, so do you have a little bit more time because yes, I cannot yes. let you go here with no, this no, because yes. something something really from what you were saying and I so appreciate what you just said, all of this. It really makes sense. But two questions came from this. The first is, you said about the territory that it was never their intention um, to grab the territory. Now, do you think what happened this very recently with this situation. Is this going to change their approach to the territory, to the land? That's my first well, question. And then will, will Russia, in light of all of this, what took place, officially change the terminology and the strategy, and this will no longer be special military operation, but this will be declared war? 
Okay, now on the second one, I don't know. There are people that want Russia to just finally stop with, with this. And they say it, this is once again, this is not me. There are many analysts, Russian analysts who say, stop with this special military operation nonsense. This is getting ridiculous, it's getting embarrassing and just do what you need to do to end this. There are analysts that say that. Um, and there are other, other people that, that say, stay the course. No, stay the course. Uh, Ukraine is a, is a, we don't want to destroy Ukraine. They're a brotherly nation. Um, let's go slow. Let's suffocate the, the European Union economically and eventually they'll break. Let's, let's play the long game. And okay. then you get all the opinions in between, okay. everything in between. Uh, this is a decision that that Putin and his team are going to have to make, and you hope that they make you hope that they make the right decision, because this is not Syria, this is not Georgia, this is not Transnistria. Here they are betting everything. They are putting the entire existence of Russia on the line. The entire existence because the people that they're facing on the other side have been very clear as to what their objectives are. Very clear, crystal clear. They haven't hidden anything to their credit. To their credit, they're not hiding anything. They don't care about Ukraine. They don't care about any. Their goal is to destroy Russia. They've been crystal clear about it. Crystal clear. We want to destroy Russia, period. So that's why I'm saying whatever decision they make, it better be the right decision. And on a personal level, if you asked me, I would say, did you really go through all of this? Did you really risk everything so you could have a frozen conflict or play defense? maybe that's the wrong decision to make. I'm not a leader of a country, nor will I ever be. I'm, I'm, I'm just a, a simple commentator and my IQ level is, is multitudes lower than Putin's. But that's just how I see things. Now, going to, uh, to your first question, I, I don't mean that the Russians don't want to take territory per se. I mean that the number one priority was to destroy the, the army first. I mean, that, that's the goal. They're, they're fighting the army, not the land. So, so they want to destroy the army. As far as Kharkov went, at first they said, yes, let's take this territory. And they fought hard to get that territory. They fought very hard to get Izium. But they, but they did it under the impression, under the, uh, under the, the thinking that Izium was going to act as a hub for them to move down towards Slavyansk and to liberate Donetsk. And it didn't work out. And this is back in mm -hmm. March. And so, mm -hmm. you know, you're fighting a, a conflict with a very confined um, troop level, the very confined military uh, presence. And here you have 10, 20, 30, 40,000 troops sitting up in the North, really not doing much of anything. And, and they were constantly getting attacked but they were beating off the Ukrainians. Every, every time the Ukrainians decided to hit them on their Western flank, they would beat them off. It wasn't a, it wasn't a huge deal, but it was, you know, these are resources. Yeah. And, and right now, Russia has decided for whatever reason, the, the Kremlin has decided that we're gonna fight this war, this conflict, we're not gonna call it a war. We're gonna do this thing on very finite resources, very finite. It's like saying, and it's like saying, um, I'm going to build the next Google. I'm an entrepreneur and I'm going to build the next Google with only, I'm smarter than, I, I'm, I'm a build, I'm a multi, I'm Elon Musk. I've got all the money in the world, but I'm going to build the next Twitter and I'm not going to use any of the money that I have. And I'm going to do it with, with $10,000. I'm infinitely smarter than all the management of Twitter. We already know that I'm, I'm a better marketer. I'm smarter than them. I've got a better team than they do. I've got better ideas, I've got better technology, but me and my team, we're only where we're gonna take on Twitter with that eh, 10, $20,000. And we're gonna build garage. a company bigger from the than garage. Twitter. Yeah, from a garage, yeah, exactly. And that's how we're gonna do it. Maybe they will. Many great businesses have been built from a garage. 
But well, you said that's there... also questionable. Can I just say how he came into? Yeah. Yeah, that's questionable. I agree, but you know, you can you can sit there and say, okay, well, maybe chosen, but, chosen but, one, but, you chosen know, but one. you say, yeah, but you say, Elon, you know, you you got two hundred billion. Why don't you just take mm-hmm. five billion of that and just you know be done with these Twitter jokers? <laughs> you know, that's kind of the thinking that someone would say. Yes. You know, you you probably yes. you you probably can just take the interest off of your two hundred billion and and use that to build a, a better a better Twitter. I, I'm giving a very Simple example. That's kind of what you feel like. Everyone mm-hmm. knows. Everybody knows. Even Ukrainians know. Even even Zelensky and his in his clown puppet stupidity. He even knows that if Russia really wanted to end this war tomorrow, they can do it. They can do it. But everyone, everyone around the world sits there and, and they scratch their heads and they say. Okay, I understand the reasons. I understand the history, the culture. You want to, you don't want to destroy the, the infrastructure <laughs> or the people. And I mean, and I'm saying those are excellent reasons. I'm, I don't don't misunderstand me. I'm saying those are yeah. those are incredibly important reasons why you don't want to go full into a country. The most important. I wish I wish the U.S. military would think like that. But the first thing the U.S. military does when it goes in, it's it levels everything. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you're kind of, I have the feeling, to just, just to end it here, this thought, I just have the feeling that, unfortunately, the Kremlin has kind of boxed itself in. What do you mean boxed itself in? It kind of boxed itself in, in that it's put these restrictions on itself, and it just, it seems unwilling to remove those restrictions. Hmm. It's not flexible with changing the dynamic. It doesn't seem like it wants to change the dynamic, and and it seems that it, it it's it it can't. It, it, I just get the feeling that 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 they're they're not able. Something oh. in 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 the mind in the strategy is stuck. They've just kind of they're stuck on this plan, and they want to see it through. But I'll go back to, to what I said. You better be right because you're betting everything. You're betting it all. If I was a gambling man, I would say, you know what? It's better to, to just figure out a way to, 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 to find peace then, to find a peace deal, because this is a huge risk. Yeah. This is a huge risk. But you can't find a peace deal now because you've already come this far. You see, maybe but, back in March, you could have done that. But actually, Boris Johnson I've, flew to Kiev and he said, no, no peace deal. Yes, he, he yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, in a way that the, the West, the collective West is trying to call Putin's bluff. You know, I, I, I have the impression that the deep state and the uh-huh. globalists, they know Putin's limitations. They know Putin doesn't want to go all out and they're using it against him. And for some reason, Putin can't break free from those limitations. And when I mean Putin, I mean the Security Council. For some reason, they can't break free from those limitations. I think you just nailed those, it now. You nailed yeah. it now. And, and I think this those limitations, it. just so people don't misunderstand, those limitations don't involve destroying cities and, and harming civilians. They can come in many different forms because Russia has many, many tools at their disposal. Many. They could have cut the gas off to Europe way, way back at the beginning, if they wanted to. I'm not saying it's the not right thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not saying it's the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do. And there's many reasons why they kept the gas on to keep the revenues flowing. And all that. There's a thousand of re- thousands of reasons, but I'm saying my point is that Russia has many, many levers that they can pull. It's not just this, this blunt hammer and nail that, 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 that they have in their toolbox. They have many, many things. And they have, and they have the hammer and nail, and they have the, the the missiles if they want. I mean, they have everything. Yes. The country's right next door to them. They have everything, but for some reason, they're stuck on on hmm. you know the screwdriver, the, the one tool they want to do. They want to build the house with just a screwdriver. So. And a plan. And a plan. Yeah. A plan and a screwdriver. Plan and a screwdriver. That's that. That's it. That's how it seems. But I, once again, I could be completely, I mean, you know, they may have planned everything out perfectly as well. And we, and, you know, we all may just be overreacting and just 
speaking nonsense too. You know, these, these are very, these, these are people that I, I, I said it before and I'll say again, these are people that are infinitely smarter than I am, infinitely. But well, on the outside looking in, on the outside looking in, as people who aren't sitting at the table and privy to their conversations or their thinking, you sit there and you say, what is going on? Mm -hmm. It's natural. And I'm not even a Russian citizen. And I imagine Russian citizens are even more invested and even more emotional thinking what's, what's happening. Tell us something, tell us something. So Where they don't, they don't say much really, Alex. That's yeah. the thing. They don't say much. Yeah. Okay. Another t-shirt suggestion is I'm not a military expert. Yeah, <laughs> we get that a lot. <laughs> yeah. And can, can, I can, I, can I just say, can I just say also? Okay, but to, to end on this, this is me going a little bit spiritual now, everyone. As strange as it sounds, I feel there might be some chance of some form of negotiation now. I know it sounds crazy what I just said, but I have this sense in my gut that something's gonna give in there. Something's gonna Maybe. change with this. Maybe. So Alex. Uh, if, yeah. if there is a negotiation, I, I think it would be probably to the detriment of Russia. In other words, it would be a negotiation where Russia yeah. gives up more than than, than they probably would like, because at the moment, I'm not saying this is a reality. The reality is Russia is winning. And the reality is Russia has everything in their, in their uh, they have all the capability to win, mm -hmm. period, easy. I mean, there's, there's no doubt about it. There's zero doubt about it. But the perception much of the perception is that Russia is a little lost at this moment. In other words, I would say that now you're not exactly at your, at your best moment to negotiate. If this was a business deal, I would no, say sure. you're probably yeah. negotiating from a position of, I don't want to say weakness, but the perception is that you're negotiating from a position of weakness. As, as a loser, as a loser. <sighs> You know, the wind right now is at the back of Ukraine. They have the wind to their back. Perception-wise, not reality-wise, I want to be good, not reality-wise, reality-wise, Russia has this. They have it. But perception-wise, <laughs> Ukraine has the, the wind. Optics, those optics, the right? Optics, yes, the optics. And it's very dangerous because because we've had many wars in history where the smaller country, because of the momentum and because of the optics, came out ahead, even though the other country was much bigger and much more powerful. You can, you know, Alexander in his video mentioned Vietnam, for example. And, and Vietnam suffered horrific losses, multitudes higher than the Americans, but they, they did it, they managed it. Uh -huh. This is, but this is infinitely more is at stake for Russia because this is not America saying, okay, we're, we're gonna leave now. This is Europe and NATO saying, okay, now we're going to destroy you. This is, they're not gonna leave Russia alone. That's, that's, the, that's, that's my belief. They're not gonna say, okay, well, let's go back to how things were before the special military operation and just leave it there. No, that's not, that's not, that's not an option for, for the West. Okay, there is no point to negotiate. Once again, only, only Putin and, and his team know, know these things. But in my mm -hmm. opinion, I would say that you're, you're coming from a position of weakness, optics-wise. Mm -hmm. oh, I always, always want to stress that because people are going to jump down my throat and say, oh, Alex, you're saying that Russia's weaker. This, no, obviously, I'm just saying the perception today as of September 12th, optics wise, it's not, you're not in the best position. I'm not saying it's a tragedy either. I'm not saying people should panic or it's a tragedy or anything like that. I'm just saying that, that a lot is at stake here. And so you, you, you better hope that whatever strategy is in place or that any negotiations that you wanna take uh, 
further down the road or even today, you got to make sure that, uh, that you do it right. Because once again, the collective West, they have made no secret about what they want to do to Russia. They've made no secret about it and they're going to do it. They're going to do it if they're given the opportunity. Thank you, Alex, for today. You went much over your precious time and I appreciate. But before I let you go, I have to ask one completely different question because I love this art behind you. <laughs> yes. And I would like to know how you make the selection. Is this like, I don't know the artist, I have to admit, sorry. But if you can tell me um, how you pick up the art, what it has uh, to this, tell this you. Is, or... This is um, my father. Not his painting, but he's the one that's selected. Wow, okay. Yeah. So I like it. But this is a nice, <laughs> nice picture because it's a clock. And if you look very closely to it, the time, it has all of the, yes. the companies, it has McDonald's, it has CNN, and it just kind of shows okay. how, the, how the time is moving and how we're all kind hmm. of helpless in this, in this uh, consumer neoliberal society, I guess is the message that the artist is trying to portray. I don't know. That's how I see it. But that's the beauty of art. Everyone sees it, can see things mm -hmm. differently. Thank you, Alex, so much. Do you want to say where people can find you, those who have not seen you on yeah. my channel yet? Uh, the okay. Duran.locals.com. And you can find uh, find me at uh, Alex Christopher. You can find Alexander at Alexander Mercurius. And definitely look at his video that I, that I referenced. I will attach and, below. Uh, oh, yes. And the Duran channel as well. And you can find us on all the platforms. YouTube, all these say Rumble, Rumble, Rumble Odyssey, we should Rumble, Telegram, Telegram, all of it. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. All of it. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming on again today. Thank and you. thank you everyone for watching. Um, yeah, hopefully until next time, probably next month, who knows. Cool. Thank you everyone. Bye.